And my whole goal had been tech should, it can solve so many problems. There's so many ways that you can apply it. It doesn't do it on its own, but there's so many ways you can apply it to do good in the world. So uh, at one point I was at a company that got sold and finally stepped back and said, what am I waiting for? It's time to do this for real. And I joined Benetech 10 years ago. And the reason I was attracted to Benetech and what we do is it's all about technology serving humanity. What, what are the areas where tech can make a huge impact in an area where the for-profit world is not solving it? Because Benetech is actually a non-profit social enterprise. And how, how can we do this and bring things to scale? So all those things absolutely appealed to, to me and to everything I always wanted to do. Um, Benetech, as, as you heard, does a few different things. Uh, sometimes it's confusing to people because we work in a number of areas, but we actually are a software organization. We develop software, we have a software development team, and we implement. So we get very deep in the problem areas that we serve. We don't just you know, build something and throw it to somebody else to implement, uh, which you know, I think there's a, a place for that, it's wonderful, but our, our role is to actually dive deep. So we do a lot in um, everything to do, everything to do with education for people with disabilities is, is one big area. Um, uh, we're also doing a lot in areas in human rights uh, around the world. So everything from now doing an online game to make it more exciting and memorable and interesting for somebody who can understand how to be safe when they're doing human rights work. Uh, all the way to areas in the social sector, very much like my first startup, how do we connect services? So I'm really looking forward to talking about a lot of our uh, things around inclusion and technology and how you can scale it. Yeah, so the next panelist is uh, Shashank Pandey. Uh, so Shashank is uh, co founder and CEO of Convy Genius. And uh, you know, we were also discussing with uh, Shashank over lunch, and he was telling, about, telling us about very exciting work about uh, affordable technology solutions um, to not uh, remedial students uh, in education. And they've reached about a quarter million students in over 500 schools. And maybe Shashank can say a little about himself and about his organization. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Shashank Pandey, and I'm the co founder of Kambi uh, Genius. So, how many of you have heard about Convigenius? Nobody else. So, you have. Okay, we just met over lunch. <laughs> Nobody else. So, um, and it's because, because we are just a five and a half year old organization. And uh, we are a social enterprise based in Delhi. So, not many people in the south know us that well. So, my background, you know, personally uh, has been in computer science. I am a triple ID Hyderabad graduate. And uh, I'm not an MBA, I'm not a PhD. I have no background in social work, rural development. Uh, whatever I've learned in life is by you know, meeting people, uh, going on the ground, interacting with my consumers, users. We have been building something very interesting. Uh, so like, you know, many of you use Facebook, right, as a platform for entertainment. So we are trying to build a platform that can, uh, you know, personalize education you know, at the last mile. So by personalization, I mean, you know, any child sitting at, uh, sitting in any corner of the country, you know, the child could speak any language, could have a dif could have very different IQ. Uh, you know, the competence level, uh, you know, could be very different. The child could be surrounded by a, by very different environments, you know, teachers of different qualities, parents with different backgrounds. Then how do we personalize education incorporating cutting edge research, incorporating the people around that child. So the, the role that our technology does basically is to, uh, first of all, obviously, to create that guiding path for the child to learn and also uh, you know, unite the people around that child to constantly nudge that child to you know, keep moving forward. I think uh, you, know, you uh, people who are interested in education, because I'll speak more about education, uh, so every you know survey that's done, be it SR or be it national achievement survey, every survey says that learning is not happening. You know, and I, I, I fundamentally believe that if we don't catch our children very very young, you know, during their foundation years, we, we lose them. 
So we at Convigenius basically uh, are partnering with a lot of uh, governments, a lot of CSRs, NGOs. So we have taken the partnership route to take our platform uh, to a lot of people who need it the most. So, and we have currently impacting about 250,000 children across 16 states in the country. And uh, so being a 50 people unit sitting in Delhi, we have been able to reach scale. Uh, you know, considerable amount of scale, 16 states is, is not uh, too less. It's because of our ability to do partnerships and uh, we'll talk about these things later. How do we partner and how do we... Because social enterprise is better, as West C said, you know, it's a very interesting uh, thing. You're neither an NGO, you're neither a corporate, you're neither a government. You know, you have to, you have to bring everybody together at the same table and make them accountable and ultimately get the, get the outcomes for which, you know, you get paid for. So, so looking forward to interesting discussions, uh, you know, during this uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Supreet Sekha. Uh, Supreet uh, works for Samadra. And Samadra is actually a very interesting organization. It's actually a consulting organization, but primarily consulting with the govern government and helping them do better governance. And uh, Supreet has, uh, was also in the for-profit sector. He's worked in, um, in companies like KPMG. And uh, you know, uh, you know let, let's welcome him and ask him to tell us about both himself and about Samadra. Thank you. Uh, I'm Supreet. Um, I'm a finance graduate from Sriram College to start with. Uh, I'm extremely passionate and impatient uh, for solving solve governance issues at scale in India. Um, my experience for the past 10 years gave me uh, different lenses, put forward different lenses of India, uh, which I've essentially had the opportunity to understand. I can give you a brief about it. So I worked at EPMG. Essentially we were trying to, while I was there, we were trying to understand integrity risks in companies in India. And these are companies that are potential targets for mergers and acquisitions by Fortune 500 companies or the other private equity. During those two to three years, what we really understood was how does innovation and Jugaad, the Indian hacky view of innovation, how can that be used for all the wrong reasons? We are a bunch of smart people in India uh, and how do we sort of manipulate through the loopholes in, uh, in businesses? How do we fudge our books? What are the different ways that companies align with political leadership? All of those are things that came up to me and as a finance graduate, my career did look very promising or at least I was not uh, very convinced about the space. Uh, but that was also a time where uh, I ended up doing a project for my uh, alma mater, for my school, uh, where we essentially understood the impact of teaching learning styles on student learning outcomes. It was one of the visits that we went back uh, to our school, my partner and I, and we realized that you know we've been in this institution for seven years and we were growing up and now we don't see that connect between the teachers and the students. Let's figure out how do we solve or how do we understand it. And at that point, we didn't have any experience in education. We used to sit uh, every day at night after we finished work, four days a week. And we understood the education system in India, in Singapore. Uh, and we tried to see how do you evaluate a system? And how do you do it quickly? Um, and then we ended up doing this project for our school and, and the feedback. And, and we looked at data of the past 10 years of the school. And we also looked at uh, conducting interviews with teachers, did sessions with the students. And once we proposed uh, the final proposal to the board, they were not just shocked, uh, but they were happy that somebody could quantify all of this. Uh, and then we realized, you know, this is what we could do in our free time. And then this is the challenge in one of one of the uh, boarding schools which has adequate funding uh, and has, has adequate processes. Then what's the problem of education in India? And what's the problem of education across different rural areas and across different government and private schools? And that's when I joined an NGO, uh, Pratham. It's one of the largest NGOs in uh, education in India, worked there for four years. Uh, and I was on the ground for a year in Rajasthan, Gujarat and spent more time in different states. But that gave me a very good perspective of India uh, from a bottoms up uh, perspective. It, it really showed what are the challenges that different organizations and government governance systems have while delivering services uh, at different levels. Um, after that, uh, and, and then we set up measurement teams at scale for uh, Pratham's programs that ran across 70 states, we built a team of 60 people. Then the problem statement was, if this is the problem in education, NGOs solve it in a particular manner, but if you were to systemically solve all the issues in education, and if you were to take this up, how would you do that? And the answer was working with the government to solve it. You had to be part of the solution and you had to uh, be there right from the start till the end. 
and that's when uh, I joined Smagra. Uh, Smagra is essentially an impact driven uh, top tier Indian governance consulting firm. Uh, we work with political leaders and bureaucrats to drive scalable impact. Um, and essentially what we do is we combine a top down management consulting approach with a bottom up understanding of the governance ecosystem and we leverage technology and data to deliver on a mandate. We work on different sectors from e-governance to uh, education, uh, agriculture and employment. And we're focusing currently on four states, uh, Himachal, Haryana, Andhra Pradesh and Pradesh. I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Let's learn all over again. Thank you. Maybe I'll give a little bit of context before I ask my next question. Uh, the context is as follows. We have, uh, you know, I, I lead Microsoft Research in uh, Bangalore. And uh, in our lab, you know, we do uh, work in uh, traditional area of computer science, like you know, algorithms and uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning systems and so on. But uh, you know, for the past 14 years, we have had a very interesting research area for technologies for emerging markets. Uh, and this, this is actually a bunch of researchers with PhDs. It's an interdisciplinary group that contains both computer scientists as well as social scientists. So we have ethnographers, we have actually an economist, um, um, uh, human computer interaction experts. And they really focus on the role of technology in socio-economic development. And we have had very many experiences in uh, doing projects in the lab, doing deployments in the field, scaling them, and so on. And a pattern that I have seen repeatedly come up when you use technology to create uh, a societal scale impact, particularly scale impact, is sort of the interplay between technology and the social technical system that on which it is part of, right? And one of the lessons that we have learned is that technology, for it to really scale, needs to be an enabler and amplifier of people. Essentially, it's people's intent that actually creates social change, and technology provides uh, the sweet spot to do an amplification. So I wanted to just ask each of you what your perspective on this has been. Maybe you can uh, answer this through your own experience in using technology to have a uh, scale impact. And what are the sort of non-technical aspects of things that, need, that you need to combine in order to have impact of scale? Maybe start with this sort of good Benson. Yeah, yeah I, I love that question because it's so critical. I'm, I'm often in a room with a bunch of people in the social sector being the engineer saying, the tech part's easy, it's the rest. Um, our, our biggest service, and many of us, uh, we all sort of have an education bent a little bit, um, our biggest service is called Bookshare, and it's now the largest library of accessible books in the world, and we have over 600,000 users in 80 countries. And solving the technical part, we were very leading edge at the time in 2002 when it was founded, doing e-books, those weren't really so popular, but it's because of that that we're able to scale. That's the core, but then all the other pieces that came with it were partnering with 850 publishers, including Profit Books, and many in India uh, and other parts of the world to, <coughs> to make sure that we had a flow of content, because it doesn't matter if we have a great platform unless there's great content. The other piece, as my co panelists know, you can't go into a classroom without thinking about are the teachers trained? Are, you know, do people have the right technology to access? And you know, as we started working uh, in India several years ago, for example, smartphones weren't as big a thing. Uh, so you know, we had to think about what what are the technologies that people have available to them, and let's meet people where they are. I mean, that's changed a lot here, but not entirely. And there are many countries in Africa we're working in. So. That's a technology problem, but in fact, part of the solution goes beyond the technology. It's, it's thinking through where people are and what solutions really matter. And I'd say the other piece is uh, we had to do a lot of content processing. So we started out where we would digitize paper books. Uh, and again, in, in great volume, we had about 7,000 books a month, every month to our collection. So we have also over 620,000 books. Um, but we started out just scanning in books and digitizing them, and we still do a fair bit of that, uh, but that's another piece where, yes, there's a technology component, but we also then had to say, how do we make sure they're absolutely correct? So we also needed to innovate in a business model area, which was, how do we get groups, some in India, some in uh, Laos, some in Kenya, some in the US, to actually proofread those scans so that when a child is learning from our books, they're not seeing a bunch of mistakes, but just caused by scanning. So, yes, there's a technology piece in all of this, but there's also thinking about the business model, thinking about the scale, and at my final, I guess, point on this would also be kind of 
and coming to scale with how you're funded. We started out as purely a, a revenue-based model where we would charge for our services, and then the U.S. Department of Education came and put out a competition and said we need a better way to provide accessible books to our students. And so this is a great example where to hit the next level of scale, we actually went through the people who should be paying for school books, which is the government, and, and now that's enabled us to scale the technology, the business model, all of these pieces. So um, but there's a lot of key components to this, and I do think it comes from really understanding the field and then innovating in all areas. So I think, as I told you, so we work in education, uh, and we have chosen to work in the low-income markets of the country. You know, students who go to government schools, students who go to uh, affordable private schools. You know, affordable private schools mean mean anything less than thousand rupees a month. We consider that to be an affordable private school. Uh, we also uh, work with a lot of remedial students who. Do not even go to a formal school, but uh, you know are enrolled in an after-school learning centre. Uh, many of you in the development space might have you know heard about Nanni Kali. Nanni Kali is probably the largest girl-child education inter intervention. Uh, you know, and they sponsor 10 years of education uh, right from class one to class ten. And this happens in after-school centres that are set up in the communities. Uh, and the centers are run by the community teachers, again hired from the community. So, when we look at technology, you know, we obviously we have a background in education, and it's building the product is the, the first step to it. But, I mean, the only differentiator between what successful and what is not successful is the non-tech component. You really have to master that to be able to achieve scale. So, I think in education particularly, we use technology to do two things for us. One is to improve access. You know, when we started building this technology, this platform in education, we thought that there is an ocean of content available, you know, across the across the world. There is Khan Academy, you know, there is a lot of open source content available, YouTube is there, a lot of companies like Pratham Books, for example, they have free open source content uh, which is created for for common good and there are a lot of companies who I mean whose content is not available for free but it's available with a small license fees for example. Now imagine if a if there is a small company a startup which is creating some fabulous games for children and these are learning games and these are being developed in Amritsar. So how would a child sitting in, in a government school in Hubli would be able to access that game? So we wanted to bridge that access gap by aggregating a lot of content so that whosoever is giving to is ready to give us the content either for free or with some license we were able to aggregate that content and we were able to show that content to the right child at the right time through our, through our technology so the first thing that we are using technology for is the access the second thing that we use it for is data when we started working in education uh, like 5-6 years back there was very little data available uh, around how children are learning, you know, uh, how teachers are teaching, and so. But the government was spending a lot of money, you know, in teaching the teachers again and again and again and again. We thought that we need to bring bring in some 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 sort of a transparency, some sort of a you know, uh, discipline, some sort of a accountability into the system. So we use data to drive a lot of things on the ground. For example. You know, when you walk into a hospital or a, or a clinic, a doctor does a, does, a, does a blood test and a few other tests to be able to diagnose what the actual problem is, then accordingly, you know, you have, you have, you have suggested a medicine. So why can't we do that for education? But you need data to do that. So, one of the things that we are trying to use technology for is data. When we have data around children, you know, what do they know and what are the gaps in them, we can suggest what they need to do next. So a class 5 child in a government school, if, if the child is actually of class 2 level, you know, you can't actually, you know, force content which is of class 5. You have to adapt accordingly, according to the current learning level of the child. That can only happen through data. 
We also use data to drive a lot of capacity building activities on the ground. Uh, but I think all of this is good. Uh, so technology can definitely, you know, give that access. WhatsApp has done that, you know. Uh, data, obviously, yes, uh, that's a value addition. But to make it successful again, the social engineering aspect of it is, is very critical. You, know, you need to understand that the people's psyche, you need to get into their psyche and, and solve it locally. So, in, during the initial years when we were just giving this platform, just in, installing our software onto the computers and the, and the tablets in the schools or the learning centers, we were having, let's say, 15 to 20 percent improvement in maths, English or whatever subjects the children were learning uh, through our platform. After a few years, we, we introduced something called as you know, a, 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 a field officer on the ground. And a field officer would be somebody you know, who would look after 5 to 10 schools and would be a local guy who would speak that language. You know, let's say if we are working in Guntur in Andhra Pradesh, so that person should know Telugu, should have, and should, should have the sensibility to understand the background of the children and can really, really engineer the, the processes around how do you use that technology. I think that's the, the biggest differentiator to make it work. Uh, right, so I'll just pass it on to Shidam. Thanks. Your, your question about societal engineering. It's a question to all of you. All of you must have used a Flipkart or an Amazon at some point to order something. Or you would have known about what an Amazon is. The question is the product that they have is not making you do something that you don't want. Only if you have a product available on Amazon will you use it. Only if you, now today, if you can see the ratings of something, will you go and purchase a product. If it has bad rating, probably would not. So we are in an information age where everything around, everything that is being built in technology is essentially centered around us. Typically what happens in governments is, they don't have that problem safe from the start. Because if they build something and it's mandatory for you to get a license to that process, you have to go through that process. So human centred uh, centered approach doesn't necessarily uh, uh, become a conversation starter. It's a necessity which is demanded by either the central government wants it or some political leader comes and says, I want to build this, let's do this. That's where it begins. But the challenge is, everybody has to go through the process of using that and face the challenges. There is, if you were to, or if a lot of you who, are, who live in India, if, one, if somebody was to ask you how many services does the government give in your state or how many schemes does the government have in your state, I can certainly tell you your answer would be at least plus minus 40 percent. And it's not just you, it's even the bureaucrats and the political leaders. Because there is no one place that in a state anybody can point out and say how many services or uh, schemes are there. Uh, now the problem is, if you go to, so one of the things that we worked with, with the government was to bring over 600 services and schemes in one state onto a single platform. Uh, what this meant was, I had to understand who the user is. The user could be me and you who, who knows how to use a, we know how to use an app, right? So we can go online to avail the service. But the user is also somebody who is in a village that doesn't have an office. So how does that person who is illiterate, doesn't have an office close by, go avail the service? So the problem statement here was really about understanding how do you build a solution where you can increase accountability, where you can increase the benefit that the user has as a citizen to avail the service. And how do you do it in a manner that it remains in the system for a long time and it's done by this. So that's something that we worked on and what we learned was the solution has to be owned by the individuals and has to be centered around all the uh, people we have to understand, as uh, Sean was saying, all the users. But I think the, the one point about the aha moment, I don't know if you're going to be discussing that after that, but what is interesting is if you center it around people, the ownership starts increasing constantly, slowly, slowly, but then you will come in a, you will reach where there's a, you will reach a point where there will be a peak in accountability and that is what is exciting if you center it around users. To give an example, when this platform was built, we had very clear visibility of how many services in a state are being delivered as per the timeline in a particular district by a particular app. So you had a rating for every service and every department in every district. What this did was, it started conversations between different districts to say, why, why are your people doing better than mine? What, what is it that you are doing right? How can I learn from you? Secondly, on the ground, when, so this is not just it, right? You also want this data to be public. Because ultimately, citizens want to know that if I avail the service, how long will it take? Or what are the challenges other people face? 
So when we work with the government uh, and taking the honourable minister's point, the government, the, it's a myth that the government doesn't like to work or doesn't have competent people. It's got very competent people. It's just about having the right information with the right people at the right time and decisions will be taken very well. Uh, when this happened, when, the, when this dashboard was live, different departments had information about their services and immediately they started taking more ownership and the, the surprising point was after certain months the government was also okay to make that entire dashboard public and you know that is opening up the entire government where you can see exactly which service is really bad in which mistake. And that was not just it. Uh, we also have these pockets of government which is extremely uh, inspiring. There was one government which we also said in northern India we have a lot of people who migrate to Canada, uh, especially from Punjab and Haryana. So one of the government officials said, you know, my cousin lives in Canada and my brother-in-law, he comes back and he says, you know, I got my driving license in seven days. I didn't have to interact with anybody. It was very seamless and, and the car looks very nice. He said, and, and his point was, we've done so much. I want to, after a certain amount of days or months, tell my cousin that we get it in five days, right? And we don't have to interact with the government, there is no problem. That's what I want to drive. So you see that ownership once it starts coming in, um, if you centre it on humans, is phenomenal. And then, and that's the path which you really uh, aim for. So, I also want to ask the, a little bit of the flip side of this question. And uh, this is also uh, you know, from experiences that I have seen in our own lab. Where, I mean, often times when you work in uh, technology, you have scaled back. Um, there are certain pitfalls about using technology. You, know, you actually start with a solution that seems like it might work. But there could be various reasons why actually it ultimately doesn't work. Well, I'll maybe start with my own experience that I've seen and maybe then I ask my panelists whether they've seen many experiences. There's a, there's a product in our lab called 99 Box. So 99 Box is about um, using technology to do medication adherence for tuberculosis. Like tuberculosis patients, like they have to take medication for six months in order to get complete cure. So healthcare workers need to monitor it, whether people are taking drugs every day. So in our own lab, right, we, we designed technology which involved a really small device that you can attach to a phone, which has a fingerprint reader, you know, that the, the user is counseled to touch every time they take a pill. Ultimately, it was very difficult to scale because it was hard to manufacture, it was hard to actually bring the cost down, uh, it was hard to scale. But I can tell you what finally worked. I mean, what finally works is actually work with pill manufacturers. And then we just work on a pill pack which reveals a phone number every time a pill is taken and the count and the patient is just counseled to give a free call, you know, quote unquote a missed call. Actually that's actually you know, much less expensive, it just requires only paper and that's what the system uses, right? So I'm just wondering whether uh, you yourself had uh, ex experiences where you start with tech one technology and then you sort of dumb it down and make it frugal, uh, inexpensive in order that it scales. You, know, you can go in any order, put your hand up. Uh, Uh, India is such a diverse country, you know, uh, any technology solution, you know, if it really has to penetrate and go to the last mile, it has to be, you know, gone through multiple iterations uh, and you need, really need to be close to the customer and, you know, co-create solutions with them. Uh, so, I think, again, coming back to, you know, my own, from my own experiences, I can say that what has worked for us in Punjab might not work for us in Karnataka. Uh, you know, Again, the basic literacy levels are sometimes different. You know, you, you, the starting point is again the not not the same. You don't have a common uh, ground. So, and also uh, that's one thing. Second thing is when we build technology for the for the development market, it has to be priced very very appropriately. Uh, the way we are trying to you know uh, build very high end, super simple technology but again keeping it very very affordable is we are building it in a manner that it would someday become a social good like how you know google map has become a social good today you know, or uh, how Aadhaar has become a social good today so we are encouraging a lot of people to create content uh, contribute that content to us so that we are able to unite and get together people so that Ultimately, you know, our cost of production, of creating content, of doing a lot of things, you know, comes down. Uh, another thing that we do to, you know, help reach scale is because actually the cost of technology, you know, uh, cost of running servers, cost of doing customer-server interactions is not that much, frankly speaking. 
Where, so where are, where are the costs? The costs are either the, the content that you are supplying through, through your plat platform or the, the high touch support that you are providing on the ground. Now if you employ uh, you know, guys from IITs or IIM to do your ground work, you know, it will be very expensive. Right? What if, if we can really you know, hire some, some freshers who can be trained and skilled to do that job? We most recently launched the fellowship. And we go to colleges uh, such as Sant Sangaji Institute. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. So they mobilize a lot of rural communities, get those children, uh, you know, in college, and sponsor their college education. And we then hire those people who work as our field officers on the ground. So, so there is a there are a lot of angles to it. Is what I mean to say. Uh, uh, so does that answer the question? Yeah. I also want to hear actually cases where you try something that didn't work. It did not work. It didn't work. Right? Like, like, let's see, yes, Yes. Yeah, it, it's uh, a thing in Silicon Valley uh, to say failure is good, uh, but only failure is good if you learn from it. Um, so we actually do celebrate uh, if we have some failure or at least a pivot away into some new areas. So we have something called Benetech Labs where we're generating sort of little social startups within Benetech all the time. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, based on some of our other work in human rights and other areas, we realized everybody kept saying, well, we need an app for this and an app for that. And about half the time we tell them you don't need an app, you actually need something else. But what, what we also found is that we said, well, you know, there's this need for data collection in a lot of areas. So maybe we can do a, an app generator. So on an Android phone, we could just give this tool to organizations and they could just make their own app really fast because we can do it really fast through some of these open source tools. And we learned, um, unfortunately, that all the organizations were saying, well, this sounds really cool to get a data collection app. Can you make it? And even though we thought they were going to be able to just run with these tools, that is just not what they wanted to do. So that has actually now changed and morphed into a whole project area that we call Data for Inclusion, where it's not just looking at apps. We're not asking anybody else to generate an app. We're actually looking at how many data sources could come in to give people a voice, women, people with disabilities, people who are poor, anybody that maybe doesn't always get their information up into uh, a project, the SDGs or any, anything else. So it's been really an interesting path, but that's a great example where it just looks like a total failure. And then we sort of said, what do we learn from that? And we learn people really do still need their data to be collected and need better ways to do that, uh, and better ways to share it and collaborate, but it wasn't about building their own apps. <laughs> so I, I want to add one thing. Actually, I, uh, you know, we have a lab in Redmond. In fact, I first joined there before I came to India. And uh, last month when I was visiting there, I realized every month they had a lunch called Failure to Lunch. It's like a pun. Uh, we failure to lunch. And, and then they give nice lunch and somebody talks about what they're trying to do. Yeah, I think it's extremely important to, in this community in particular, right? because it's, you know, they, there are lots and lots of things that we try that actually don't work. Um, and it's extremely important to talk about it because if you don't talk about it, then other people will try to say that. Right. So I think uh, it's an extremely important thing to do. So, so you know, since we have a little time, I want to move on to our next question, which is uh, which is uh, partnerships. Um, and uh, maybe we'll talk. We'll start with Supreet here because um, you know when I was talking to him over lunch, he was talking about how important you know his work is actually about really connecting people and building partnerships. You know, just like technology and social engineering are parts of the system, it's really partnerships between government, uh, you know, tech social enterprise that really creates movement and maybe you'll start with uh, your own views as a group. So I can give an example of uh, uh, how partnerships work between uh, with government. Um, you know, the fundamental reason why governments partner, uh, why governments would want to work for you is not just to create value, it is also to work together and build have that thought leadership between both of you. And what is fundamentally important for that is trust. Uh, today in the discussion before this, uh, in the Honorable uh, Minister was saying that uh, you know, I, I tell people to, uh, that I look at it. Uh, what is important from there is, even if people come back and do their research and come with a model, 
building trust in the system, building trust with the leader is uh, fairly simple. Building trust with the ecosystem, with the entire government is harder. You may build trust with the people in the headquarters. Building trust with the district is harder. You may build trust with the district. But building trust with the people who are going in the villages is even harder. So how do you, what's important is that you must demonstrate certain success and onboard people. So to give an example, when we were doing this project of bringing all the 600 services together, uh, there were 37 different departments and all departments work with as an isolated units with their leadership, with their entire history. What was important was to work with them to show them success up to a point and then start onboarding them. So we never had a meeting with the secretaries of the state initially. So we worked with the CM and we ensured that we brought certain services onto this platform and had that example. That's when all the secretaries came. And when they came for that meeting after three months of this work going on, they actually believed in the fact that this is possible and the fact that this can scale and then they wanted to be on the bandwagon because in tech and government if you see something happening you feel very insecure that why am I not doing it so as a result they want to be on the bandwagon that's one particular point second thing you want to understand is for the government they want to follow the process and which is essentially part of how they work um, it's important to show them value while you're following the process it's important to show them the value of how whatever you are doing even though they follow the process, can still enable them to do the process better. So sometimes, for example, uh, states have this mechanism of integrating uh, to send you know, SMSs to citizens for their services. If you tell them that there is a service at a state level that everybody can integrate with, without having to do it individually and having the right support, the partnership is fairly simple to do. So there are these different elements uh, that come into partnership. And the last point I want to focus on is uh, political thinking. Uh, every politician is also there for a particular reason and will have his own incentives. So it's not uh, uh, correct to keep that as the basis, but you must also consider that. You can't run away from it. So to give an example in Haryana, where we were working to get these services, there was a time where, the, where uh, there was a discussion about having certain schemes for the marginal uh, poor uh, section as a separate set of schemes and to have it in a separate center. But the question there was, why don't we leverage economies that we're using in different systems? So they, the concept is Anto there, the last person. So we merge both of them to ensure that it's one service. So you have to keep that political thinking in line. Because what happens is it's not that it's incorrect. But they come from their, uh, uh, you know, they have certain compulsions. But considering that is also important. But not making that the central focus of the project. So you also need to put here from both Pepsi and Sashant that leaders of organizations as to how you think about partnerships. So I think, uh, Ultimately, if you, in education particularly, uh, so there are 200 million children in the country uh, and we have only reached out to 250,000, which is not even, uh, you know, 1% of the children uh, we need to reach ultimately, you know, either through us or through somebody else taking our platform. So I think our, our approach to partnership is very, you know, need driven. For example, most recently when we decided to work in Jammu and Kashmir, and you understand, right, Jam working in Jammu and Kashmir is not easy. We are working in some of the difficult terrains like Leh, Ladakh, Kargil. You know, forget about internet, there is no, not even a mobile network there. So how do you make your technology work, which is, you know, which requires internet uh, at least once in a week. Uh, the platform can run offline, but how do you make that work? So that was one of the failures that I have missed uh, in, the, in your previous question. We had to really re-engineer that solution in a manner that all the data from all the tablets uh, can be synced to a teacher phone, teacher's phone, uh, like a hotspot. And when the teacher comes down the hill, imagine Leh Ladakh, right? The schools are there at the top of the hill. When they come down the hill to get monthly, uh, you know, uh, ration, then the mobile would get, get some network and the data would get synced to our central server so that we can take decisions as to you know which school is lagging behind and what capacity we need to build. So you need to really need to reiterate. But our approach to partnership again coming again. Now there's nobody who was willing to go to those locations, you know, and be our field officers there. So we had to partner with a very committed NGO who was only working in those regions. So we partnered with 17,000 feet foundation. And the name suggests that they're working at 17,000 feet height. So and they had very less funds. So we, there was a problem for funding. We approached a lot of CSRs 
and ultimately Access Bank agreed and they gave us the fund to start this in 100 zones. And after this, I mean, this came in as a risk capital. And after this, after this, you know, had some decent success in terms of learning outcomes, the government also started contributing in money. So as on date, I think we have tested about 200 schools and about 50% com funding comes from the government. So, as I said, right, so, and also one of the things, one of the problems that we were facing there was electricity. For any technology to work, you need a device, and for a device, you need charging. Then we had to approach another corporate who was into solar power. So they donated a lot of solar panels to us. And now the tablets in those hilly areas are getting charged to solar power. So that's our approach to partnerships. To make learning happen, we need to collaborate like never before. But for that to happen, you need to build a network. You know, uh, for example, tomorrow, for tomorrow, let's say if you have to start in Karnataka, unless you know the funders, the government, unless you know the grassroots NGOs, I mean, it's very tough for somebody coming from Delhi and do innovation locally in Karnataka. So, building network parallelly and making connections at the right time is, is, is uh, has to be done in parallel. Thank you. Maybe Betsy can add. Yeah, sure. Uh, for us, partnership is one of our really core values of our whole organization. We have probably, I don't know, a couple thousand partners around the world. Uh, we have for our Bookshare service, we have 850 publishers who give us their books for free. Um, we have groups, I mentioned groups that help us digitize, so a group in uh, Chennai who employs people with disabilities, so people who are deaf and people who uh, have mobility impairments who actually proofread the books that then go to uh, people who are blind. Uh, so I think there's there's many ways to do partnerships, and, and I also love what then your partnerships can blossom into. And this gets to something we talked about at lunch about what's next, and if you don't mind me jumping into that really briefly. So for us, we want to put Bookshare out of business. We shouldn't have to run this library when now publishers are producing ebooks. Now they're making ebooks in most parts of the world. It's still getting going in a lot of areas, but now is the time, I started saying about six years ago, to say if anything is more digital, it should be more accessible. So that scale, just the next level of scale is not us as a small, you know, nonprofit social enterprise trying to do this, even though I think we've been scaling pretty well. Pretty well isn't enough. So how can we make sure that every single book published is now going to just work for every single person? That's partnership, right? It's it's because of those same partners that we went to and said, here's why this social mission is important, and they got it. Now they're turning around and they're saying, okay, you can do it, and we'll help you because we also run a whole other center where we do global standards, so we can actually tell them, like, here's how to do it, and we'll even help you do it and we'll connect you with other partners who can do this at scale. So so I really think that partnership is critical and this idea of reimagining impact is it's it's sort of that think at the next level. So okay that's great, we're doing this wonderful job, you know, let's pat ourselves on the back, but now let's turn around and say what's gonna really solve the problem forever? It's that kind of thinking that I think is critical about partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. I think in some sense, actually, the ultimate scale is when you can exit yep. and your partners can take over. That's really the, you know, it's very, I think it's one of the very important differences between for profit and for social enterprise. Right? You know, we are trying to do something where the problem is solved and unique dimensions no, no longer even needed. Right? Uh, so with that, I think you know, I want to have uh, some time for questions from the audience. You know, we can maybe take that. Uh, 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 oh, so switch to the questions here. Yeah. Uh, testing my glasses here. Yeah, can you please share you know, some uh, interesting use of current technology or new technologies on how you are um, solving social problems? Um, you could help us in replicating uh, some ideas for our organizations. And this is from Chandra from Nirvana organization. So I guess actually the way I think of this question is actually, you know, we've been talking about education and our work, right? And this is, you know, maybe sort of more new leading edge things that you're currently thinking about, maybe not fully cooked. Uh, I think they want to have uh, some sense for new things that you're thinking about, maybe that you haven't scaled out entirely. Uh, and then put your hand up and talk about that. Even the current ones, 
on some interesting usage in the end uh, user delivery so that we can start replicating some of those ideas in our existing projects. So you're, you're on existing projects. Yeah. Technology or a cutting edge use case, two different things. So I would say the use cases are many, um, and use cases are uh, sort of evolving. Using simple technology for these use cases is, I think, the key question here. Uh, if you look at the problems around you, uh, in terms of communication to citizens, right? That's one particular uh, point. If you look at any particular uh, application of a company, so like I said, Amazon. Or let's say you're booking a flight today, right? There's a lot of communication to you. Flight is getting delayed. Uh, there are things. Uh, or your package is getting delayed, right? Or you get delivered. I think that's one particular aspect which I see increasing a lot, which is com communication with citizens for different services, for different projects. Uh, it's already happening in certain states, right? So that's one particular point. Another interesting use case uh, to know is uh, in in Haryana, for example, the roads are bad. Uh, I'm sure it'll be they'll be bad in different states, but the point is, how do you give the citizen power? Uh, how do you power them to say, I can send complaints to different Governments, what they try to do is try to have applications uh, for citizens who, like, who are in cities and even in the, for basically for citizens who can use uh, phones to file these complaints there and then. So, if in Punjab there is an application where if you see a street light broken, you can uh, you can just take a picture of it, right? Uh, so, these I think the, the key point is engagement with citizens is the key point that I see uh, different use cases evolving towards and different technologies being used in an interesting way to address. I can add a couple of things, right? Like, for example, uh, in the West, uh, there is a lot of energy on self-driving cars. You know, cars don't drive themselves. And there's a bunch of people in our lab, you know, who show you know, a, a picture of uh, you know, some of the main streets in Bangalore, and they ask the question, right? Will any car in the street drive by itself? And, you know, there's really funny pictures of intersections in India. It's unclear, you know, whether a self-driving car would go through that any time during our lifetime. So, you know, but there is a technology, this is technology work that we ourselves are doing, where we use similar kind of computer vision and those kinds of things to monitor driver behavior, to see whether the driver is drowsy, uh, you know, whether they're using a phone, and we can use the same kind of you know, machine learning, um, uh, computer vision kinds of technologies to actually just ensure whether drivers are behaving safely. Right? You know, and actually another problem in India is that you know, there's lots of places where you can actually get a driver's license without actually doing a test. There's lots and lots of people who have got driver's license without actually doing a test. Right? You know, having, having technology safeguards to ensure that a person did all the things that they did needed to do to actually pass a driving test, right? So I think those are examples of some of the things that you know we are actually working on. I, I can I'm happy to talk to you more about them. I think he wants to hear more about you know not just education, perhaps other kinds of problems where actually technology can have. Uh, do you, do you have any? Do you want to add anything, Betsy? Yeah. Maybe take another one. Yeah. Maybe take uh, two more questions. You, yeah. And then you, yeah. So, uh, my question was more around the importance of the social or the human side of uh, things when you're taking technology for having impact at scale. Right? I mean, uh, you mentioned some instances like fellowship program that's used to work partnerships. But when you're using technology for scale, how do you scale that human piece of it? It takes a long time. I mean, for you to build a fellowship piece which will help you on the ground to implement your technology in schools, how do you overcome those challenges? Uh, how do you overcome resistance from, say, the digital facilitator? In your case, a teacher. Uh, uh, or, you know, in your case, I the publishers were willing to come. How do you overcome those challenges beyond the first five or ten who share your passion and passion? Any stories, any insights you may have? Yeah, you know, the human side, like we talked about, is probably harder than the tech side in most cases. So I, I, I guess I would put a, sorry, a couple of, of examples there. Um, I mean, one would be uh, one of the services we're working on in the U.S. It's, it's actually uh, somewhat similar to the government service we heard about, but for non-governmental service groups that are doing human services. How can their data about their services be found? So that's not really a very hard technical problem. There's so in the San Francisco Bay Area, where we're starting, we know this area quite well, um, there are about 25 of these databases. So if I'm looking for shelter, and I go to one of them, I might not get the right information because they just don't have it. And that's just ridiculous. Uh, you know, we have the internet, we have ways to connect data. 
but it is, we have spent a year working with those organizations that have this data to build trust, to build collaboration, not just with us, but with each other, uh, and now we're developing software. So truly, people are getting very excited about this service, ServiceNet, and I, I occasionally internally remind our team we don't actually have code yet, but the important and hardest part is the trust, and I think that's also another angle on partnership because it's back to literally considering your users as your partners and saying, how should this work? And that is really a trust builder, when you actually truly engage them, truly listen, truly involve them in the solution, so we're not dictating what the solution is, they are, actually. So, I think that's probably the best thing I can say on, on the scale side, since you asked about how it goes to scale then, right? I think that early stage is what we've got to kind of do in a very proximate, local, sort of intense way, but then you see what works and how do you replicate that. So when we look at doing this in other cities and other countries, which we're already thinking about, you know, we're looking at, okay, how we probably wouldn't sit in Palo Alto, California and try to build trust of a bunch of organizations in Delhi, but I bet there are some people we can work with in Delhi that could take that model, make it locally relevant, and actually make a model like that work. So, so I think, you know, you have to look at it as a process, and maybe it's, I'm reflecting that I am an engineer here, because I think if you can, you can make something a system and make something a process and go to scale, but it is harder on the people side. You can't just, you know, code it and it magically happens. It takes, it takes dedication, um, and I think that is another thing that with the social sector... I think I'd like to add yeah. to it. So, I think the... Not every human is equally motivated right, to do the same work. But I think in our case, data makes things easy. So what we identify right, for the human aspect to work, so if, if it's not working, if, the, if this, the outcome is not as desired, there could be two issues largely. One is it could be a motivation issue. The second is it could be a skill issue. Right? If there's a motivation issue, what can we do to solve it? And there's one thing that we have learned from Samagra. We work with Samagra in Haryana. I mean, we put those teachers, people who are not that motivated, we put them in a WhatsApp group. And we probably get their bosses also on, you know, in that WhatsApp group. That has worked for us. It's a very simple idea, it works. You know, if it's a, if it's a motivation issue, you know, but you are getting paid for that job. You need to do that job, even if you are not motivated. How do we get that work done? Surround them with bosses. Second, if it's a skill issue, you know, you, if you have the data to prove it, you can always you know, go on the ground and re-skill them. So I think data makes things easy, but it's, it's again, it's a very complex problem. And that's the only differentiator I see. So my first point, if you look at a government system, typically you will never see people, especially the bosses who are in the headquarters, talking to folks on the ground or appreciating them as often as a other a private system would do. Uh, and what we've seen that really works in the government is, the, the WhatsApp group that he's talking about, essentially we have lots of WhatsApp group where we have officials at all levels. Because A, that's the first time you're on a platform with somebody who you only interact with or see once in a year. Secondly, for every time you do something correct, not correct, sorry, every time you do something which is, uh, which is good and you're doing it consistently, you get recognized for it, right? And you get recognized by the person who is leading the department, right? So that's a lot of positive reinforcement. And I think sometimes what we just lack is the right positive reinforcement of people. And if you continue doing that and, and me keep messaging correctly, uh, as opposed to only calling them when things are going wrong, the system will work. And we've seen that happen at all the levels of the government in this country. Okay, with that, I think we're out of time. I want to thank all of you and the, my fellow panelists for such a productive discussion. Thank you.